Hello, dear digital ship friends. Welcome to our VPO webinar. Today, we are discussing vessel performance management projects for big fleets. We are excited to introduce you to our two guest speakers, uh, Frank Paleokrasas, who is the head of data governance and analytics uh, with the Bernhard Schulte Ship Management, and Pankaj Sharma. He is the manager of Columbia Control Room with the Columbia Ship Management Company. The discussion will be moderated by Carl Jeffrey, founding editor of Digital Ship, whom I'm inviting to start off our conversation. Okay, thank you, Vida. So we're gonna look today at what vessel performance management looks like with very large fleets of ships. So we've got two speakers from two of the world's largest ship management companies. So looking at the numbers on their website, Bernard Shorter Ship Management has 600 vessels, 15,000 seafarers and 2,000 shore-based employees. And Columbia has 380 vessels and 15,000 employees. So when we were discussing this, something that sort of emerged is there's a depth and a breadth aspect to this. So the breadth is how you manage performance across all of the vessels when they've all got different sensor systems on board, different software systems, different people on board running them, different requirements from their customers and owners. And you want some kind of basic data standard so you can compare them. So if you could give each ship a score, that would be very useful, but that's very hard to achieve in an objective way. And then we've got the depth, which we're continually looking at better ways to uh, do more clever things technically so get a better understanding with the limited amount of data we've got from ships using analytics and improving the data quality so we're going to have two 10-15 minute presentations and then we'll open up for questions so first which is sort of representing the breadth we've got Frank Paleocrasas, who's head of data governance and analytics with Bernard Shorter Ship Management. So he's going to describe the challenges of managing performance data for a large fleet and some of the some of the developments of the company. Frank is a naval architect and chartered engineer, and he's been at the Shorter Group for 12 years. And he previously worked at BSM's as BSM's Group Fleet Management Performance Manager and Bernard Shorter's technical manager. And then sort of representing depth, we've got Pankaj Sharma, who's the manager of Columbia Control Room with Columbia Ship Management based in Limassol. So he's going to talk about a project to develop virtual torque meters. So that's using data analytics to work out what data a torque meter will be providing, but rather as a way to avoid spending $20,000 on data collection and transmission systems. So he thinks the analytics, well, he's worked out the analytics achieved 98% accuracy, 95% of the time, which is about what you'd expect from a, an actual torque meter. Pankaj is a master mariner and he was at sea for 13 years, including with Maersk, NYK and Anglo Eastern. And before joining Columbia, he was a senior manager with marine operations at Maersk. So first I'd like to invite Frank to give his talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carl. Good morning, everyone. So let me give me just a second to share my screen. Yep. Okay, can everyone see? Yep. Good, okay. So uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Frank Valocrasas. I'm uh, BSM's uh, Head of Data Governance and Analytics. And today we're gonna talk about uh, fleet performance management on a large scale. So uh, the title of the webinar is actually uh, fleet, fleet performance projects, but for us, uh, fleet performance is not a project, it's actually an integral part of our operations. And through this uh, presentation, I'm gonna explain more about this. So a little bit about our company. Uh, the Schulte Group uh, expands through all the sectors of uh, uh, marine services, starting from ship owning, uh, as Bernard Schulte with 90 owned vessels, ship management, the part that I belong in, and then um, various maritime services, including new building supervision and crucially software development from MariApps. So as Carl already mentioned, we have uh, approximately 600 ships under management. Uh, as of this morning, actually it's 625, I just checked. Uh, out of which 433 are fully managed. And uh, the reason I am showing all this to you right now um, is not to flex or anything like this, but uh, more to actually make you understand about the variety of the fleet that we have under our management, from 
all shapes and types and sizes, of course. And understandably, this presents a unique uh, challenge when uh, you're trying to uh, assess the performance of all these uh, different ships in, uh, in a manner that is actually uh, just and fair. So um, in order to achieve all this, uh, five years ago, we established a, a, a fleet performance management on a group level. And um, for this, to achieve this, basically, we decided to um, invest in our tools in the ERP that we already have, which is PAL, um, developed in-house, and expand into the level of uh, uh, vessel performance. Uh, so the way that all of this is based is whenever a ship enters our management, we build a digital twin for it. And uh, we continuously, therefore, uh, compare its operational performance against how it's supposed to be um, uh, how it's supposed to be performing based on its uh, uh, digital twin. What we do is we, of course, uh, normalize uh, all of the operational variables such as weather, such as draft, uh, such as speed, everything uh, in uh, following ISO um, methodology, but actually going a little bit further because it's a little bit restrictive in some cases. And we combine all uh, available data, and this includes manual data, as well as telemetry, as well as AIS, and uh, Hincast Weather and other uh, third-party services. So it's important, however, to, uh, to, to, uh, to clarify here that manual input, manual reporting, is the very basis of our systems, because we cannot hinge on a particular uh, uh, technology, such as telemetry, to assess the performance of all our fleet. We do have approximately, no, as of this morning, we have 50 telemetry ships uh, integrated with our systems. However, uh, we cannot expect that all of our ships will be uh, on board in telemetry at the moment, or basically, let's say, in the next couple of years. So telemetry data, automatic data collection, is used to enhance and, uh, what we what our crews already report using uh, our uh, manual reporting systems. So, Frank, uh, with a grey rectangle on the screen on the far right, I don't know if that's on your computer. Ah, uh, sorry, that's uh, that, that was you <laughs> actually. <laughs> that was the speaker of Windows. Apologies for that. So, um, we. In order to achieve all this, we have uh, a targeted and automatically escalating alert system. So our systems automatically check uh, for any deviations uh, in performance and automatically alert the personnel responsible. Uh, and this uh, this system escalates by itself, meaning that from the technical man from the technical superintendent will escalate to the fleet manager, to the fleet director, and then to group management. We do have, uh, we do believe, of course, in uh, uh, artificial intelligence. We do consider it an integral part of our analytics. And uh, one of the main um, uh, intermediate applications that we have is uh, predictive hull inspection recommendation. So this is actually, if you can see here, this traffic light indication here, where based on the performance of uh, the ship, we can more or less, well, actually in a pretty accurate manner, uh, predict when uh, hull inspection should take place uh, within uh, within a window of three, six, or nine months and above. Of, of course, this uh, this means that we can uh, get better planning and opt and uh, uh, do the do uh, hull cleanings in the most cost-effective manner. Charter party performance, of course, a very crucial part of our operations. We we have uh, a very systematic way of approaching this, and our system is able to. Uh, produce a speed and consumption description of the ship based on its operational profile at the click of a button. Our system is, of course, uh, used for emissions reporting and uh, monitoring. It is our MRV and IMO DCS compliance tool. And we do, uh, because of the variety of the types and size that we talked about, we do cater for everything. So uh, for two and four stroke propulsion, of course, and we we have a very strong focus on uh, dual fuel. Uh, as of this morning, we have uh, 26 LNG carriers under our management, with six more coming uh, over the next uh, months as new buildings. 
So understandably, uh, LNG uh, analytics are of crucial importance to us. Uh, likewise, we support all types and makers of engines and uh, provide the corresponding analytics. And we are now moving towards prescriptive en engine fault diagnostics. So this is all well and fine uh, when you're talking on a fleet man on a sorry on a vessel management level. But what happens when you're talking about a fleet? What happens when you have uh, so many so many ships as we talked about before? How can you uh, monitor all this if you're if you're on the level of a, a fleet manager, for example, and you have 30 or 40 ships under you? So. Um, we started uh, creating the tools that aggregate this type of data. What you see here, okay, I've uh, redacted the vessel names, of course, but what you see here is one very specific API. This is speed drop, and this is an indication of uh, hull fouling. And um, what you see is aggregated uh, information from 400 ships for all offices, which I've redacted as well, and uh, the vessel types. Nonetheless, this is not very clear because again, you're just looking at one KPI and with uh, 10 major tools currently on our, uh, on our system and, uh, and as many KPIs as you can imagine that this, uh, that this means, um, it's, it's very hard to keep track because one ship might be performing in one KPI, might not be performing in another one. So we decided to, to build a system that aggregates everything. So, um, Enter our vessel performance rating. So what you see here, okay, the, this is taken from our production uh, environment this morning. Uh, the tool I have to explain to you is not 100% uh, ready in the sense that not the entire scope is there. But what you see here at the bottom, it's basically uh, a selection of the KPIs that we have started this, uh, uh, this tool with. So as uh, anyone that has worked with KPIs can tell you, not KPIs behave in the same manner. Uh, so, for example, um, here the delta SFOC, for example, is better if it's less, whereas uh, other ones might be better when they, they when they are larger. And also, it's not very easy to remember the ranges that you're talking about. So, uh, we decide to aggregate everything in the manner that you see here and introduce color coding so that anyone can very easily understand whether it's good or bad. Going further, one level up, we thought we'd group them so that you know we have one group of KPIs that are corresponding to hull and propeller, one that corresponding to main engine, another one to auxiliary power uh, utilization, and so on and so forth. Going one level higher, uh, sorry, before I say this actually, I have to clarify that on this level, all the um, KPIs, the, these aggregated scores, are normalized from zero to 100, so that you know 100% is good and zero is bad. And again, color coding as explained before. Going one step further, we, we separated it into three areas, voyage performance, reporting quality, and machinery performance. This way, we know that voyage performance is looked after by our marine superintendents, machinery performance is looked after by our technical superintendents, and reporting quality is looked at by both because we place a tremendous amount of importance to it. As anyone that has worked with analytics can tell you, garbage in equals garbage out. So if our reporting quality, uh, our data quality is not good, then uh, ultimately our analytics are not reliable, right? So finally, going one level above, we aggregate all of this and we create a single score for every single ship. Going beyond that, we thought, of course, we would aggregate all of these KPIs into the fleet and separate them into three zones, the good, the, the normal, and the bad, so to say, in a simplified manner. And on top of this, aggregate it all. So, of course, what you see here is, is my view, um, which is the, the entire uh, managed fleet. But as, uh, as our management is split into the several offices, uh, this, is, uh, this is actually the, um, the aggregation that every user will see will be based on the number of ships that uh, he or she has under their care. Crucially, the, um, all of this is fine, so to say, when it comes to 
uh, performance, but how can you link it and make people accountable for it? So we thought that it's extremely important for us to directly link fleet, per, uh, fleet performance with, personnel, with staff performance. And in order to do this, we have directly linked the, the average, which is uh, the fleet um, performance, as you see it there, specifically for every user, directly with their own personnel KPIs. Moving over to technology, of course, none of this would have been uh, possible without uh, the use of technology that we have uh, developed in-house. And uh, uh, a crucial um, uh, push that we've had um, uh, in the last couple of years was uh, Mariaps joint veg uh, I have to clarify again, Mariaps is our in-house uh, software development company, and into a joint venture with uh, Navidium, a technology company from uh, uh, Finland specifically uh, targeting telemetry powered solutions. So the, um, the achievements that we have so far are streaming telemetry. This means that instead of package, uh, uh, auto log data uh, aggregated into packages that are sent three, four, five, six times a day, uh, telemetry data is simply streamed across to the shore on a continuous basis. I was just looking at the system yesterday and I had two minutes lag compared to what was uh, being measured. Voyage optimization with weather routing and uh, ECTIS integration. This is something that we consider uh, of uh, critical importance, particularly with uh, uh, the operational measures uh, pushed by IMO with CII and what have you over the next uh, few years. As you understand, all of this will, uh, was done before. However, this will be fully embedded with our systems now. And uh, using, uh, using machine learning, we have some pretty accurate consumption and arrival prediction based on the uh, predicted uh, uh, weather forecast. We offer the service of a manned uh, vessel operation center, of course, because uh, added uh, support is uh, is viable and now uh, we have uh, three pilots crucially coming one is cargo monitoring and energy management because with uh, i think it's two-thirds of our fleet ultimately being uh, gas carriers or tankers we have a lot of power for heating or cooling cargo and uh, we need to more closely monitor this and manage it over the course of the voyage Edge computing on board analytics is something where I personally have, I'm placing uh, a lot of uh, uh, importance because in this way, uh, when we say about edge computing, we, uh, we mean that the analytics happen on board as opposed to ashore. So uh, the data is collected on board, processed with our algorithms on board and displayed directly to the crew on board without the delay of streaming ashore and then having someone to contact the ship uh, to uh, uh, with a suggestion or recommendation. Understandably, this means that we bring uh, decision support to the people that are actually ultimately able to influence decisions, uh, uh, the situation in a fast and effective manner. These are our crews and not our shore staff. Finally, uh, coming to the, the automation benefits of telemetry, we are looking at, uh, well, in Q4, we'll be doing a pilot for automatic uh, or near automatic completion of uh, noon reports and updating of uh, PMS running hours. Underpinning all this, of course, is the technology that uh, has been uh, uh, composed by Mariaps. It's our ERP, PAL. Uh, on the right here, you can see all the various modules that are offered by this very expansive uh, ERP that we have built over, over the next, last decade or so. Uh, and you can see that we, we span from chartering all the way to, to travel insurance, crewing, uh, PMS, uh, uh, BI analytics, uh, and even applicant portals. So uh, this is truly an integrated and end-to-end -end solution uh, with uh, support from, uh, from our entire group throughout. So 
and I'm coming to, to the last part because this is actually what, what distincts us. We have been doing this for a while. We have been, uh, we have been shipping for 138 years. So uh, uh, we, we know a little bit about it. And uh, everything that you have seen, all the systems that we have built have been based on our business requirements. We're not a technology company that is building products and then trying to find use cases for it. We're doing exactly the opposite. Likewise, because of this expertise that we have in the group, we're continuously refining our products with uh, uh, active shore stuff that we have, as well as uh, mariners that uh, are part of the working groups that help us to continuously refine our products and ultimately uh, help us del deliver something that is um, uh, alive and uh, continuously improving not just for us, but also to our third-party customers. And finally, as mentioned before, all our systems are integrated. And uh, we are following the principle of electronic logs very soon, uh, ultimately bringing it all together and uh, providing an end-to-end -end solution from, the, from what is happening on board all the way to analytics and, and back on board with the ship. So um, thank you for your attention. Uh, I have to clarify that everything that I, I discussed before is, uh, of course, uh, um, available not just for BSM customers, but also for third-party customers. So uh, in case you find any of this interesting and you would like to take this discussion with me separately, uh, you can see my email there. So thank you very much for your attention. Well, thank you, Frank. So I'd like to welcome now um, Pankaj Sharma, who's the... Uh manager of Columbia's control room with Columbia Ship Management based in Limassol, and he's going to talk about a project to develop virtual talk meters. I mean, just before Pankaj starts, you'll see there's some Q&A questions already coming in there. Um, Frank, you can answer in, in text form if, if you'd like to while Pankaj is talking. Otherwise, we can look at them orally afterwards. There should be sort of 20 minutes or so, but I'd like to welcome Pankaj. Thank you. Right. Um, thanks, Carl. First of all, thanks for the introduction and thanks for giving a nice uh, uh, brief up on what we are about to talk. Um, uh, by now, I believe uh, my screen is visible to all. So yep. I'll start. Okay, so I represent uh, Columbia Ship Management uh, and uh, we are peers of uh, uh, Bernard Schulte. We work uh, right next to each other in terms of geography also and in terms of area of operations as well. Uh, it, in terms of diversity of fleet, as well as uh, uh, diversity of uh, the uh, group operations. So when I joined Columbia uh, back in 2018, we were looking at what is the next level of performance. And uh, that's when we got down to the uh, this thing, drawing board. We decided we have to have a clear vision of what we want to achieve, where we want to be at least five years, 10 years, and even 15 years, and how do we plan for it? So first aspect of performance that we went into was we have to split proactive and reactive. There are a lot of systems available in the industry which will tell you reactive performance man management very well. They have amazing KPIs, they have amazing data analytics behind the systems and all of this. Uh, but uh, from my previous experience and from uh, where we wanted to be in Colombia, uh, we decided that we have to have a proactive approach as well. So instead of going for a system or a uh, platform which was going to do performance management for us, we decided to create performance and optimization control room, which is a 24-7 uh, operated uh, control room not just in uh, Limassol, but we have sub offices so that we can uh, share workload as per the shift timings. And uh, we've been running this for almost three years now, and we're seeing some great results. But when we started uh, with control room, after the vision and the objective of proactive and reactive was uh, confirmed, then we had to decide on a philosophy. So we went in for performance philosophy, which is the three Ps. So the three Ps in Columbia performance are the platform. So we designed, we worked, and we developed a uh, state-of-the-art performance management platform, uh, primarily based on noon reporting, but scalable for 
telemetry data as well as uh, other layered information. So managing structured and unstructured data. And we made it into a department of its own. So we used all the people in the department who have got either strong experience or come directly from the ship or have an industrial industry knowledge of uh, performance management. And finally, this is the part which a lot of us miss out, how to manage the processes. So we worked on the process aspect of it that uh, a system is only as good as how good the user wants to use it. If I do not log into the system and I don't see the performance, I've missed out uh, on the picture already. And if I'm uh, seeing it five days too late, it is five days too many tons uh, already spent. So we created the process where our department, which is control room, is already talking to the vessel for voyage execution before the vessel has departed. We are already discussing the execution strategy of uh, this voyage. Uh, will it be constant power? Are you heading for an ETA? Are you, uh, have you been given a specific speed by the owners, charters, uh, uh, agents? These kind of things. And that's how we start. All this uh, definitely feeds back into a KPI system, which gives scores on vessel bases, fleet group bases, comparable, normalized to a score of 100. And uh, we are able to measure performance much better. But then with this large amount of data and mix of structured and structured data, we started working towards what's next for us. And uh, we wanted to take a iterative approach rather than a transformative approach. Uh, so we went in for a machine learning project. So we looked at what are the possibilities of machine learning. So our first project that we did was about uh, speed loss modeling. Now, I apologize for the screens being a bit blur, but that's because it's uh, a lot of uh, uh, sensitive data for me, so I'm not able to share it in full clarity, but uh, I'll give you a walkthrough of whatever I'm uh, showing on the screens. What we did was we used uh, different formats of data, which is noon report data, uh, satellite, uh, AIS data, uh, weather reported from the ship, weather confirmed uh, by a satellite, uh, by a weather service providing company, and uh, layered weather by another uh, the same uh, weather service provider company. According to the areas, we switch uh, weather service providers. We have three weather service providers because we see that uh, depending on one is not enough. And here, what we did was we um, split the noon report data, the AIS data, and the weather data into such a way that uh, we wanted to uh, find out what aspects of the weather are affecting the speed loss. So what we did, we made the models, we made the uh, AI pipelines for uh, doing machine learning. And uh, then we tested out different types of uh, machine learning approaches. So it could have been a neural network approach or a random forest uh, or support vector machines as well. Um, then, and this was done with our uh, uh, technology company, which is also Columbia on Blue Dynamics. And we got some very good results. What you see in the background are heat maps of speed loss on actual vessels. And this is without any telemetry data. We could do this only with noon report, AIS, and uh, weather uh, routing data. And what we did here, uh, like a standard machine learning approach, we applied 80% of the data for creating the model and 20% of the data for testing the model. And once we tested it out and we got results which are higher than 95% reliability, then only we could confirm that uh, this machine learning approach works. So effectively, what we were able to create here in speed loss is what some companies invest into uh, Twin Tang or CFT uh, the same, uh, drawings, and they are done in uh, experimental environment and the scale up is not confirmed, but we took the real data and we got the real results. And when we tested it for the, with the 20% of the data, uh, our prediction, our forecasting capability were much better. Now it was just a matter of time to start thinking that we are successful with the machine learning, what's next? So we made a, a machine learning game plan. What can we do with no sensors at all? What we can do with existing sensors and what do we need to do with new sensorization, new installations? 
So the challenges were for us, uh, what's the, how do we scale up? What are the other applications? Can we compare paints? These kind of things. So we got a assignment from one of the owners uh, who is actually looking at uh, uh, applying different paints uh, or uh, selecting a paint for their future vessels. And in 2020, they were going to put two different paints on the vessel. And we said that uh, we want to take this challenge by using machine learning and AI to our advantage. So we went back to the drawing board and we said, how do we do this? So we used the uh, added resistance method and we used our machine learning experience into it. So what we did was we converted our speed loss into speed in calm waters and which we could convert into, into power correction. So that was our machine learning correction. So we now could split the power that is being used to overcome current, overcome speed and overcome weight. And this was not limited to just uh, uh, direction and uh, the amplitude, but we could also uh, correct for uh, wave period. So what wave period is the impact on, uh, is impacting the vessel and what was the swell period uh, that was impacting the vessel from different angles. So our uh, equations, instead of working in two or three variables, we were working in 12 variables and machine learning was helping us correct this. And the other good part about this was that machine learning, um, because we were going for a high reliability, so which I'll show you later, we were able to uh, remove um, the outliers very quickly. So the application by itself was identifying the outliers and removing them to make the modeling more successful. So we moved ahead. And what we did was we started mimicking the data that is coming through noon reports, partly being read from uh, talk meters and flow meters, and we converted into average um, hourly data. And now, without any installation on board, we started looking at data as if it is coming from telemetry. So this was one example, then we started uh, scaling it up. So what you see on your screens right now is the uh, data mimicking itself uh, or replicating what telemetry, uh, telemetry data would do. And here, Automatically by machine learning, we are removing outliers and we are creating uh, trends which are far more reliable. So when I talk about reliability, this slide shows the reliability. So 20, uh, as I said earlier, 80% of the data is for trends and 20% data is for uh, looking at predictable reliability. So we are using the R square method. In the first equation, you can see we're getting an R square of 0.994. So this is higher than 99% predictability. In the second equation, we are getting 0.97, which is higher than 97% predictability. So this is of course on a confidence interval of uh, 95%. So 95% of the time, our accuracy is 99, between 97 and 99%, which is, I think so in certain cases, uh, would be even better than telemetry because we are not, a, in telemetry, we are not accounting for regular calibrations. Here we are using the actual data reversed and uh, corrected for uh, external factors, and then we are able to compare the results. So of course, you must be interested what happened. So in this case, we have used two different vessels with two different paints. They went into the dry dock around the same time. They had very different areas of operation. They had very different uh, profiles and uh, length of voyages and everything. But because we are using uh, machine learning and we're using this uh, very high reliability curves, we were able to convert it into comparable formats. And now with confidence, we are able to tell our customer which paint is performing better in the last eight months. And uh, within uh, the 12 months, we will give them a strong recommendation of uh, which paint should be his strategy and what he's spending and what is his payback time and all of this. And doing it without any uh, installation on board has been the major achievement for us. So what does this mean? Uh, is this scalable? Yes. So we've always kept this approach. So what you see on the top right quadrant is where the machine learning magic is happening. But uh, we've always kept it in such a way that uh, we wanted that when we have to scale this or we have to move this into different environments, we should be able to do it. So the system is automatically sending the CSV files and they're, they're having a handshake exchange. It goes into the 
uh, machine learning environment, it does the calculation and finally the models are created. And then once the models are created and they're ready, they're in the bottom uh, right quadrant. And after this, it's just uh, the predictive aspect of it. So as soon as the voyage starts, we have the predicted weather for it every uh, six hours. That void file is ingested into the system and then it gives a result back, which is then displayed on our uh, control room screens, uh, which you can see on my background, where we are able to show uh, the machine learning predicted speed loss or machine learning predicted power usage. So our speed in calm water is converted into power usage. Our general strategy for uh, the vessels which are uh, aiming for the least consumption uh, we go from for constant power strategy. Uh, we found it to be the most uh, useful power strategy in terms of saving fuel. Uh, if not constant, we say with minimum variance in power. Uh, for there are uh, vessels which are on commercial contracts where maintaining the speed or maintaining the consumption is important. We have different ways of following that up. But coming back to machine learning. So we found that what, what have we managed to achieve? We used multiple sources of data. We used machine learning to our advantage where we were able to split so many variables into uh, uh, the, the aspects which were uh, affecting the vessel's progress in the voyage. So what we call it now is what we managed to do is we managed to build a machine learning hybrid twin. It's not exactly a digital twin. A digital twin would require far more sensorization and uh, live data uh, reconciliation with the expected uh, twin modeling. So till the time we don't do that, it's not really a, a digital twin for us. So it's a hybrid uh, situation for us. So what's the value over here? So if you look at noon report and noon report data, we know it's uh, a, the, the most cost effective way of getting data, but at the same time, the accuracy, accuracy of this data is questionable because it's being reported by uh, uh, the same individuals, so the estimation of whether it can depend on how somebody looks at, uh, looks outside and then uh, uh, records his data. The autologger or the telemetry data is definitely very high in accuracy because it can record every few seconds, average, batch it, transmit it. But at the same time, it comes at a cost. Not just the cost that there's a one-time installation and all this, but then we are also spending on uh, bandwidth and uh, um, once you start with the uh, telemetry data, it does not stop with, I'm going to get only the uh, the flow meter data or only the talk meter data. It goes on, it just uh, keeps expanding. In one vessel, we were spending close to uh, 50 gigabytes of data because we were trying to get almost every aspect of vessels, uh, the thing, uh, the autolog data onto the system. And this was proving to be very expensive for not so much value. So what we have managed to do with hybrid twins or the machine learning hybrid twins is at a fraction of a cost of an autologger, we have managed to get an accuracy which can easily compete with an autologger data. So with telemetry available or not available, we're still able to manage performance the way we could have through telemetry. So the predictive twin or the predictive hybrid twin is giving us the reliability of an autologger data. But that doesn't mean that we are not uh, going to invest in telemetry or we are not uh, exploring that. What you see in front right now is the vessel that I was discussing about. Here we are taking every data from the machinery as well as we have layered IoT sensors on the machinery. So we are looking at uh, vibration monitoring, we are looking at temperature sensing, we are even looking at uh, the smart cameras which can read analog uh, dials and convert that into digital and uh, then transmit it back to us. This is a big real digital twin project for us. And here what we're doing is we are going into predictive, uh, uh, predictive maintenance. So in this vessel itself, uh, we've been, this project actually has paid for itself in uh, six months time. Uh, the, uh, we were looking at uh, the shafts uh, performance, and we were looking at the actual misalignments in certain pumps and in compressors, and the, uh, the system gave us indication way before then there was a physical uh, uh, an alarm on the 
the, the, the machinery itself, or there was any temperature variation which could be noticed by the ship's crew. So monitoring ashore, we could even easily make out. This, we believe, is the future uh, for doing holistic uh, performance management. So not just saving fuel, but saving machinery as well. And then feeding this data, of course, into PMS, so that instead of having uh, hourly based or uh, timely based uh, maintenance, we move on into not just condition based, but prediction based uh, maintenance. So these are uh, the projects that we are getting into. And here also we are using machine learning. So we will be using the machine learning data that we've used before uh, for, predictive, uh, main, uh, for predictive consumption. And now we are using the same methodology for predictive maintenance. And that's how Columbia is taking this journey into managing fleet performance for its customers. Wow, is that the end? Oh, yeah. yeah, well, that's fantastic. Thank you very much. I think that's the first uh, presentation I've ever seen talking about machine learning from a shipping company perspective, I think. Uh, yeah, I mean, well, one of the things that came across to me was um, how as a bigger fleet company, you've got a kind of competitive advantage, both of you, because I guess um, in Bernard Schulter's case, you were showing how you can compare the ships. And in, I guess, machine learning, you also need a large fleet of ships. You can't do it with eight or nine ships. So that, that, that's fascinating. Um, there's been lots of great questions from Frank, which he's uh, very kindly answered on the text. Um, so uh, that, that's all, all very interesting. One that struck me, which maybe for both of you to answer orderly, orderly is this um, gaming KPIs issue. Um, so Frank, I think you, you answered on text that you, you were very um, confident you had methods to stop people gaming KPIs. Okay. But it's always... Yeah, you're talking about uh, basically cooking the numbers, right? Well, when you give people a target, they yeah. organize their work to the target, so it may not be corrupt. It might just be. Yeah, I mean, of course, that is uh, that is always a risk. Uh, nonetheless, I mean, uh, even even going one one step back, uh, talking about data quality, and I think this is where the uh, uh, this is where the issue uh, ultimately the problem ultimately lies. Uh, for us, uh, when it, when it comes to uh, to manual reporting. Um, we have uh, we have placed a large number of uh, validation methods, which we are continuously refining. So we started off with uh, you know basic global validations and all that, and we moved on to dynamic validations. But having modeled all our ships, having digital twins for our ships, we know how they are expected to behave. So we use that for the validations, uh, depending on the operating point that there are, of course, and then cross check across the various variables, and even if we go further, across KPIs from various data sources. So yeah, there is a lot of validation and verification going on in the background. Uh, and we, we strongly believe that that is also uh, a matter uh, that uh, helps us uh, uh, basically manage the risk that you mentioned. Well, Pankaj, do you want to answer that? And also looking at Victoria's question, which is uh, sort of similar. So she's saying if your yes. new report's got bad data, then uh, doesn't so that make your that models? Yeah, Victoria spot on. Noon report have bad data. We know that from before. Uh, and uh, noon reports have the tendency of uh, either, uh, like the reporters, uh, the reporting is gone bad by mistake, which is a typo, or this it's intentionally done. So where somebody is putting some brains over, like let me have some things in hand. Uh, the advantage of uh, KPI system and uh, what Frank also showed is that you can manipulate your way out of one KPI, but that's going to impact negatively the other KPI. The typical example is, let's say I'm trying to uh, manipulate my SFOC KPI. So how is the SFOC uh, uh, progressing on the vessel? Is it within the expected curve? And I'm always entering that. But the power used is something different. So uh, what happens is now with the relationship of fuel consumption, power, and your speed through water, your SFOC KPI may look good, but your hull KPI, which is how effectively you're using power in, uh, to move the vessel, will start going bad because uh, the relationship is actually inversely uh, proportional to each other. So you can manage to manipulate one thing, but you will get uh, the thing penalized in the other. And what we do is, uh, uh, we look at, uh, we, have, we have designed most of our KPIs which are co-dependent on another KPI. So if we see a KPI with uh, two KPIs side by side, so 
and one is moving in positive direction, the other is moving negative direction. That's a straight indication for us that there is some manipulation uh, happening over here. Uh, then coming back to Victoria's question is, how do we depend on 80% of the data? We depend on, we actually did was we split the known reports into several small reports uh, by using uh, machine learning uh, so that as if it's a average happening. And when we are putting in machine learning and we, we set our threshold so we can start at 90% confidence interval or 95% confidence interval, what the system starts doing is that it starts uh, eliminating the outliers, which would uh, skew your curve. And uh, that way we, our curve starts correcting by its, on its own. So we call it self-correcting curves. And uh, then finally, why do we use the remaining 20% of data? Now we want to know what we have predicted. Is it good enough? So we use the remaining 20% of data, which, which has got the same biases, same errors, same everything. If it is giving a good uh, predictive capability in the same data set, that means we are in the right direction. If it was not, which, which actually it happened, in certain cases, we were not getting the uh, right results in that confidence interval. So we had to discard the data. We had to look at uh, the same, uh, different timings uh, to do the same curves. So yeah, that's, uh, that's the reality to how to manage data quality is probably the uh, difficult and the most challenging question, both for myself and Frank. Oh, well, yeah, we've got some great, great solutions to it. That's fantastic. So um, I'm guessing the question from Jakob Iverson is commercially confidential, Frank, asking you know, whether data source is that, is that right? Uh, no, it's not. Uh, I, I, it's not commercial confidential. Uh, I would say that we, we are uh, directly working uh, with the source of data. So uh, the, uh, <coughs> the the European um, uh, weather service. I, I'm I'm sorry. I I don't remember the um, uh, the exact details right now. I can take this up. Uh, I can answer you directly. Uh, 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 no problem. Um, I. Please, please, please approach me. I'll provide you the, the answer. I just don't have it in front of me. Okay. So if we go to Glenn Muller's question, so he's asking if you've got a smaller and smaller real-time information gap, then maybe you can do more of the analytics on board the vessel and more decisions on board the vessel. Although I suppose you want the superintendents making the super making the decisions, not the crew. Or is that something you easy to answer for either of you? Do you think? Of? Well, I mean, for uh, for us, uh, ultimately, as I as I mentioned during the presentation, uh, we need to bring uh, decision support closer to the people that are actually able to affect uh, the the operation of the ship, and that is not the technical superintendents. Uh, so, yes, for me, by all means, ultimately, the decision support needs to be delivered on board and right away, and that way we close the loop in a faster and more effective manner, and therefore. Uh, get most of the benefit of optimization. Uh, but at, at the other side, of course, the technical superintendents and the marine superintendents need to be fully informed of the whole process, but they must not be acting as a mailbox or uh, needing uh, be the, the bad guy that's reining in from the top to, to tell the other person what to do when he could have already acted on that 24 hours before. Well, Pankaj, is that would you like to see crew taking more decisions at Columbia? Is that your philosophy or something you'd like to answer? Yes, uh, but we have taken a very different approach towards that. Uh, so first of all, uh, the decision making part, uh, you can uh, you can capitalize on different vessel data, comparing benchmarking and then pass that uh, information back on the ship. So your computing capability on shore is way higher than what you can provide on board. So on board, you can provide uh, indications on certain aspects of it for which the vessel crew can react. But on shore, we have the advantage of big data analytics. And that's why I'm, I always support that data analysis and, uh, and making sense of the data should always be happening on the shore side and not as a first uh, round review on the vessel itself because this, uh, the vari variations have to be managed. Now, coming back to how do we expect the crew to uh, take decisions? So first of all, my basic question uh, is that, uh, have we trained them? Uh, do we train our crew for performance optimization? And more often than not, you will find the answer is no. There is hardly any company which invests in training their people in performance optimization. So what have we done? We've actually created this whole control room in our training center 
where we call our ship staff uh, on rotation basis. So uh, they either participate as part of the control room or they uh, attend a five day, three day course, depending on which level they are. And they will work along with us. They will understand what are our, what is it that we do through data analytics? What is it that we do to support captain's decisions for uh, speed strategy, how to understand speed loss, how to understand charter parties. Uh, there are so many times that uh, a charter party is not properly understood and the reporting goes haywire and then we are uh, left dealing with a claim which is uh, which was completely avoidable or uh, the uh, the captain has not been rightly advised that uh, in terms of rough weather what should he focus on should he focus on maintaining the speed or maintaining the charter party uh, consumptions so uh, the general knowledge or the general uh, attitude is I will focus on consumption with the speed drop, but there are now new charter parties in some oil majors, which are actually focusing on something called target speed. So if you achieve the target speed, you are within the charter party, but the ships are not educated about it. They will never be because this is something which goes on between brokers and uh, the owners and all of this. So uh, either the captain is reading every uh, bit and clause very seriously properly or we are giving them the right training and that's why we have gone in for the training approach so our aim is that within uh, the next few years we should have uh, more than 80 percent of fully pocr trained personnel on our ships oh there's a comment from thomas beck he's saying that the kpi anal and analysis must be shared with crews so they can take action but of course Decision making is done in cooperation with the operation and technical staff, which I think you'd probably, probably agree with. I think um, there's two interesting questions here. So, well, Tom Moki Omiya is asking how much auto logging data you're actually using now. And uh, Gerasimos Mekalopoulos, who's uh, at the National Technical University of Athens, I think he's a student there, he's asking in the future, maybe we can do away with hull inspection because we can just work out the condition of the hull from the uh, um, from the uh, other data we got, considering we're talking to the two of the top marina analytics experts here, maybe it's a question for the future, but I don't know if you'd like to share any, any thoughts on that one. Um, okay, so starting with Tomoki's uh, question, um, we use uh, autolog data wherever available, as we said, we have 50 ships so far that uh, are integrated with our systems. And when I say integrated with our systems, I mean that they are showing in our ERP and uh, combined with manual data and the rest of the analytics that I uh, discussed before. Uh, the sampling interval as well, basically, and the, it goes along with the rest of your question about is your system developed by yourself or collaborating with other organizations? So we started off with one telemetry uh, vendor, as you can imagine, um, when we first started off back in 2015, I think something like that. Uh, but uh, you cannot just work with one vendor um, because one every single owner will have different wishes. So, so far we have uh, worked with three or four different vendors and overall our system has been built in to be vendor agnostic. This means that we have built our own telemetry standard where we specify uh, signal tags, we specify sampling rates, we specify data transmission protocols, absolutely everything. And whenever a, uh, a system is going to be onboarded in our telemetry uh, scheme, we basically present the, the standard and we say that the vendor has to follow it. So, um, uh, and coming back to the Sec ah, and and of course, I mean, uh, I have to say here that uh, uh, after our all all search that we had with uh, the vendors, ultimately we entered in a joint venture with Navidium, and Navidium is our preferred telemetry vendor who we work very close with. Uh, but of course, uh, in some cases, you have uh, 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 owners coming with uh, all the systems on board, and we need to hook up with that. So, uh, hence uh, the telemetry standard in place. And coming back to Gerasimos's question about uh, do you believe that hull inspection can be omitted in the future and hull cleaning can be programmed just based on data? So our, um, our system, the one that I showed you with the traffic light indication, is actually pretty accurate, uh, even though it's based on uh, manual data, because it's, it's very slow moving data, right, we're talking about, and the th thresholds are extremely forgiving. Uh, nonetheless, still, uh, we are not satisfied with the level of uh, accuracy. Uh, we do not 
uh, immediately instruct how cleaning to take place simply based on uh, these analytics. We always uh, recommend that inspection, physical inspection takes place. Usually the findings are correct, but we, we, uh, we of course want to, to become more confident as we move along. Uh, but yes, of course, to, to answer your question, in due course, I do think we will get to that point where we can omit this step. Well, Pankaj, we have about five, five minutes left, but there's this sort of three questions here I think you could maybe answer. So uh, mm. there's one from Ritesh Kumar about if your uh, AI for predictive maintenance, is that going to work together with your planned maintenance system at, at some point? Um, Shane Biggie is asking, are you using data from uh, Logic? from a PLC, I think it's control systems. And uh, Thomas Beck is asking what the top five data tags you're getting from automation. I guess that comes back to the, the speed logger. Do you want to try and take all those three together maybe? Okay, so I'll first answer Ritesh. Uh, so predictive maintenance is uh, uh, relatively new uh, right now, especially using vibration sensors for it is quite new. It's, it's a standard practice in certain navies like US Navy. <clears throat> but for commercial ships, it's still a new concept. Uh, but it's already validated. It's already accepted. And, and a lot of uh, uh, class flag state, and even in TMSA, this is also mentioned. <clears throat> to go into the predictive uh, maintenance, you need vibration sensors. We are already doing that. We are getting good results of it, out of it. And now we are uh, going into uh, discussions in how we can use uh, predictive uh, or, sorry, uh, vibration data in a fully digitalized twin by not having to go uh, the surveyor to go on board and inspect the data in our environment and give the go ahead for that machinery or give the go ahead for like, there is no need for uh, the major overall right now because all your parameters are meeting. So not just condition based, but uh, vibration based. So uh, that's what we're trying to get to. And I think so the industry is moving very fast towards this because it pays for itself very quickly. So that was with regards to predictive maintenance uh, going into uh, the PMS aspect of it. So it's a new concept, but it is definitely moving there. Um, <clears throat> aside, uh, there's a question from Sh Shane. Uh, aside from known reports, have you used data acquisition strategies that rely on PLC system data? Um, and top of my mind, I, I cannot uh, recollect what is PLC, but I'm assuming it is uh, programmable okay. logic controller. I think, yeah. like a control okay. system. I think. Yeah. Okay, fine. Yes, we uh, wherever available, uh, we do uh, layer the data. So what we have managed to do uh, in our machine learning project is not only uh, make predictions and all of this, but we also the bigger bigger achievement for us, which was on the back end side, was to use different structures of data. So, and unstructured data as well. So a noon report or an engine logbook, these are all unstructured data. A, a telemetry data, uh, the, this thing, layered uh, in, uh, weather information or layered uh, uh, AI speed data, these are all structured data. So we've been able to manage uh, the merging or managing or having a marriage of structured and unstructured data. And that gives us the advantage. So now when we want to use another structure of data, if we are already ready for it. So yes, we can use uh, PLC systems data or any other uh, data. And like Frank said, we have to be vendor agnostic. There are too many players in the market with too many different uh, tags on it. Uh, you, it's impossible for one company to sit down and make all the, the same mappings of all the systems. So it's uh, we have to go for a smart data management platform, which works through data pipelines and where you have your predefined tags. With, then you are able to ingest the data far more efficiently and make sense of it. Well, then Frank, finally, um, do you want to answer? So Ichiro Hori is with MOL in Tokyo, I think. He's asking more about Navidium's function. And if you can answer this last question in a few more seconds, mm -hmm. can you do engine modeling to assess performance? Is that, that looks like quite a lot Yeah, question. OK. Uh, so uh, Navidium, as, a, as I mentioned, is our technology partner. Uh, we have uh, done a joint venture with them specifically for uh, technologically advanced solutions, that, as we say. So uh, all the developments I mentioned in uh, that second to last slide about onboard analytics, about uh, streaming telemetry, about uh, uh, weather routing and these type of things, they are being done in, they are being developed in joint venture with Navidium. Concurrently, uh, Navidium is actually our preferred uh, telemetry vendor 
So we work very closely with them. And uh, all uh, BSM customers that uh, uh, work with us uh, usually uh, come to Navidium because uh, the, the pricing actually works out uh, better in view of our cooperation agreement. Uh, finally, yes, so we, we do, of course, uh, uh, model uh, engines, uh, two strokes, four strokes, uh, V types, <laughs> dual fuel, <laughs> you name it. Uh, we've done a fair bit, and we, but uh, the way I see it, we have only scratched the surface. And uh, the most important development that we have coming now is uh, prescriptive fault diagnostics. So basically comparing the various KPIs as they're measured on board and coming up with uh, specific recommendations as to what to do to prevent a failure happening. Wow, well, that's fantastic. Well, this, this special performance subject gets more and more interesting the more we get into it. And uh, thanks very much, both of you. I'd like to pass back to Vida to the closing words. Thank you. Thank you. We were a group of 160 people listening to Frank and Pankaj just now. We wow. hope you picked up some ideas on how you can improve your vessel performance management. Next week, we are discussing pathways to maritime decarbonization and also wireless communications on board. Sign up if such conversations are relevant for you, and we hope you will let us know if you have any story to share. Digital Ship is signing off until next Tuesday. Goodbye. Bye -bye. Thank you. Goodbye.